And now, the nations of the world. United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Venezuela, Honduras, Guyana, and still, Guatemala, Bolivia, then Argentina, and Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Costa Rica, Belize, Nicaragua, Bermuda, Bahamas, Tobago, San Juan, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, and French Guiana, Barbados, and Guam. I like that song. It's very catchy. Maybe they should be playing Animaniacs in our elementary and high schools, teach a little bit about geography to some of the students. I don't know if you caught this story, but a professor, sociology professor at Memorial University in Newfoundland called Judith Adler was decided several years ago to give a pop quiz on geography to her students because she was talking about family policy around the world and figured out that some of them didn't have a clue about the country she was talking about. Here's what she told the Post today. A sizable proportion of the class would reliably have no idea where the Mediterranean is. Some students would circle Africa and indicate that it's Europe. And if asked to locate England and Ireland, they would put them in Africa. I have had students that aren't able to correctly label the Atlantic Ocean, even though we're on it. They live in St. John's. They can look out their window and see the ocean. And some of these students couldn't locate that on a map. We have a problem in our educational system, and I've talked about this before. What's behind it? Well, I'd say books like this, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. The man was a committed Marxist who decided that facts were bad. Here's part of what he says in the book, and this has seeped into our educational system to the core. The students record, memorizes, and repeats these phrases without perceiving what four times four really means. This is in, in his argument against learning facts, like four times four. What does four times four mean? It means it's 16. There is no meaning to it other than it is 16. We're also shoving a lot of garbage into the educational system. Here's a paper by a man named Don Short. He's a law professor and human rights professor at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. He wants to queer Catholic school curriculum. He lives in Manitoba. He wants to queer Ontario's Catholic school curriculum, saying the queering of schools, official and state-issued law, can be used by those seeking widespread cultural transformation of schools. We reached out to Professor Short to have him come on the program today. He's not available, but we are hoping to get him on soon to try and get to the bottom of this. If this leaves you puzzled, you're not alone. A good friend, Andrea Morozik from the Institute for Marriage and Family Canada, joins us now. Uh, Andrea, you've got an op-ed out today talking about um, some facts around the education system, around how children learn, that people just won't be happy about, because there's a worldwide study done that found children learn better when they have two parents. Why do we go to Paulo Freire and Don Short and all of this other stuff? While we're not teaching the basics and not caring about the basics, like how children learn best, how they learn to read, what will help them? Yeah, I think politicians across the country are trying to improve and increase our education outcomes. Um, premier McGinty is labeled the education premier, um, that sort of thing. But when it comes to the nuts and bolts of how kids learn, which is what the Institute in Marriage, of Marriage and Family in Canada um, was looking at in this research piece, we find through this uh, international research piece that kids with two parents in the home do better in literacy scores and are less likely to need to skip a grade than children with only one parent in the home. And a lot of your viewers might be saying, well, obviously, how self-evident is that? I think we've hit a point where we need research and science to be backing up what used to be known as common sense because common sense is becoming uncommon. But the, the official class, in our country will say, well, how dare you pick on single mothers? How dare you attack them? But this isn't attacking single mothers. I think single mothers would be the first to admit, I got a lot on my plate. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard with two parents to be helping with homework, to be reading to children, to be helping them with reading. Are you attacking single mothers with this research? Absolutely not. And you're right. It's the single moms themselves who are more aware of how difficult their jobs are. Um, we are looking at statistics, and oftentimes this doesn't translate very well into people's individual lives. But the problem, I think, with the school system is a wholesale rejection of what constitutes good science and what constitutes good uh, research. And so when we hit on 
facts that are unpopular or politically incorrect, we try and brush them under the carpet rather than compassionately addressing uh, what that research is showing. And so certainly this is not to um, be lacking in compassion or to somehow say that single mothers are doing a bad job. We all know they're doing a very admirable, admirable job under difficult circumstances. But the point here is to create a climate in which family breakdown is less prevalent because we know that kids fare best with their parents in the home. You are in an uphill battle trying to get this because this, this is a 1960s Marxist uh, book that talks about facts being bad, that children shouldn't learn facts, they should learn how to learn and not learn facts. I've had this book repeated back to me by teachers that didn't know who they were parroting because since the 70s, since this man was invited to Harvard and helped rewrite American and Canadian educational norms, teachers have been taught facts are bad. So if teachers don't like facts, the educational establishment that governs the teacher isn't, they're not going to like the facts that you come up with. Yeah. I mean, this is going against human nature the way that, that, that they want to do it. Uh, children learn by you tell them something, they learn it, they ingest it, they can repeat it back. That's viewed as bad. I, I, I can see saying teach kids how to learn at the upper levels, but little kids, you've got to, to teach them facts so that they know what yeah. one plus one is one yeah. or two. And I incidentally learned some of those facts in my master's degree because I'm a product of our education system. So I had a, a professor at University of Toronto in the master's level who would do a simple true and false answer um, for, for students. And it mattered for a lot of, it counted for a lot of our grade precisely because he knew that half of us wouldn't know some of the basic facts, which leads, you have to know the facts before you can discuss in an opinion, in an informed way, before you can come around to an opinion. So what you have, say, for example, in our unpopular study today is a research outcome that was uh, derived through social scientific norms and is, is um, something that is perfectly defensible. But if you don't learn the facts, then you certainly can't come around to an opinion about those facts or deal how or figure out how to deal with those facts. If teachers are social emancipators and they don't teach the facts first, then what are they emancipating children from? And that's the sort of view that you see with the free air book that you've held up here. Yeah, well, well the, the teachers are the oppressors. I'm guessing. Andrea, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the work that you guys do at Institute of Marriage and Family Canada. You know, we'll get Andrea's study. We'll put it up on the blog, liliespad.ca. Uh, it might make you angry, but we'll put it up there anyway. Let us know what you think. Stick around. We've got more to come.